Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, and appreciate the opportunity. It's always an honor to be able to do these things. Thank you. Um, the last time I checked, the last time I did one of these power hours with you was in November twenty eight. No, to November 2017, actually. Mm -hmm. So, so quite some time ago. It was an age back, and if I recall, you mentioned uh, before your stock pick was Tesla, which paid off in spades. Yeah, it was indeed Tesla, and it's it has paid off. But I must say, I've had a bit of a, a almost a love hate relationship with that stock over the time since then, because you know you get bullish on it and you get a bit bearish because of the debt level. So it's it's look, put it this way: there's plenty of volatility in that stock to take advantage of. If you can get on the right side of that volatility, it's fun to trade. There's, there's do, plenty do, in it. Do, do you find, before we dive in, and I know people are keen to, to get to the presentation, do you find that the more you trade perhaps a particular stock, <clears throat> excuse me, you almost get better at the chart? You get a better feel for the chart perhaps as you spend more time trading in a particular stock? Or, or to you, is it just agnostic across a chart's chart? Um. Look, a chart's a chart, but you do kind of get to feel the personality of certain shares. And mm -hmm. you, there are certain characteristics with certain shares. So Tesla does have its own sort of personality. It's a stock that's got a very high short interest in it, yeah. which means that it's always susceptible to short squeezes. Um, and you, so, you know, there's been quite a few opportunities to take advantage of those squeezy moves to the upside. And right now, as we speak, it's busy coiling right into the sort of an apex of a of a what they call a volatility contraction pattern it looks a bit like a triangle mm -hmm. um, and it looks to me as if the shorts are about to get another hiding there potentially if that squeezes higher soon so yeah it certainly does it uh, does have its own personality and as i say it's one of those stocks that can be quite squeezy um, yeah. which makes it interesting and you learn to sort of feel that uh, action in the stock and be able to trade it accordingly Cool. Excellent. Cool. Uh, over to you. On with the show. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Well, it's nice to be able to do this because of the technology. As you said, the last time I did it, it was live in person at the JSC in, in November 2017. So as much as I'm no longer in South Africa, it's nice to still be able to speak to the South African audience and still be very much a part of the financial community there. So uh, yeah, as Simon mentioned, I'm discussing risk as a trader today and how to manage your risk. So the points that I'm going to look to cover um, are the following. So first of all, and this is the most important question you're going to have to start to ask yourself right at the beginning of this exercise is how much capital do you have in your trading business? We will talk to that. Then how much of that capital are you willing to risk on an individual trade? Then you've got to be aware of clusters. I'll talk about those and what that means. Um, then how you size your position for optimal risk management and how many trades you should have open at one time. Then I've got an interesting exercise that you can all go and try and do if you've got the patience and the discipline. It takes 30 trades and see how, how you perform on it. And then the last point will be to illustrate the power of compounding your returns even when you're taking very small risk. And I think that will surprise you to actually know the power of compounding. It really is a very, very powerful force if you get it right. So let's get into each of these bullet points one by one. And the first one, as I mentioned, is how much capital do you have in your trading business? Um, notice I've termed it a trading business, and I think that's very critical. You need to treat trading like a business. Like any other business, you go into it with a plan, like a business plan, a strategy, and also you're going to put up capital to start that business. And if you think about it, if you started any other business, you would do that. You would, you would have a business plan. You would know what you're going to be doing with your business, how you're going to, how you're going to run that business, and how much capital you're going to allocate to that business. Trading should be no different. You need to treat it like a business. The key considerations in terms of that capital is that a it must be capital that you are willing to risk. Uh, so you need to effectively be able to ring fence that capital and set it aside and say this is trading capital for my trading business. It's separate to your long-term investments, it's separate to your buy and hold investments, um, and it's also um, capital that you are willing to risk. And that's critical. It shouldn't be money that you really are desperate to, to hold on to. Um, not that you're intending to lose it, but you know it shouldn't be money that you need to pay your kids' school fees or to pay your bills at the end of the month. It should ideally be a, an amount of money that you can set aside, ring fence it psychologically and physically, and allocate that to your trading business. 
Uh, the third bullet point on, on this slide is that you need to be adequately capitalized if you're going to have a fighting chance at success in, in the business of trading. And I'm often asked, you know, how much is the right amount to start trading with? Uh, people come to me and they say, I've got 5,000 Rand. Can I start trading? Well, I've got 10,000 Rand. My answer to that is really, ideally, if you want to do it properly and you want to take it seriously, and actually have the best chance, I think you need six figures. So 100,000 Rand is, is the number I think that you should aim for if you're wanting to trade and trade properly. And the reason why I say that is for a couple of reasons. The first thing is your transaction costs uh, will kill you if you've got a very small account. So to give you an idea, I mean, it depends on where you trade, but a lot of brokers, certainly the broker I use, charges 100 Rand per trade as a, for a CFD trade minimum. Irrespective of the size of the trade, you're going to pay 100 Rand um, as a minimum. Now, if your account is only 5,000 Rand, then that 100 Rand minimum charge becomes a disproportionately large amount of your exposure. Whereas if your account is 100,000 Rand, well, then that 100 Rand minimum fee suddenly is only 0.1% of your capital. So it's insignificant. So that's one of the reasons why I think you need to be adequately capitalized, just, just so that it allows you to overcome the transaction costs. And the second point is that you need to be realistic about this and accept that there are going to be a couple of losing trades along the way. And you don't want to end up in a situation where you've had two or three or four losers and suddenly you know, you've, you've got your back against the wall and you've lost the bulk of your money. If you are adequately capitalized and you've got a decent sum of money in your account, you should be able to wear a string of losers and still actually be able to come back and fight your way back to profitability. So that's the, the, the point about being adequately capitalized. And then the last point there is that you can't, you can't trade with scared money. And this comes to the psychological aspects of trading. Trading is not an easy thing to pursue. It's probably one of the most difficult things you'll ever try to do from a psychological perspective. It becomes a whole lot more difficult if you're scared and if you're afraid of, of losing. Um, just because if you're afraid, you will, you know, you'll make the wrong decisions, you'll do silly things. So the point about trading capital is that you need to have money that you're willing to risk and you, you're happy to take the risk on it and you're not scared of, of, of losing some of that money. That's critical. And I'm going to show you some examples here today, but um, for the purposes of all the examples that I'm going to show you, I'm going to assume we've got a trading account with 200,000 Rand in, in capital, and you'll see we'll get to that yeah. as time goes. And I want to say, Garth, it's one of the things, and I, and I agree with you around the six figures, and I know that a lot of people are like, Yowza, if I had that all that money, I wouldn't need to be a trader. But a small amount, you, you, you know, you, you, you can't do proper risk. Your, your costs are disproportionate. And, and treat it, I love your analogy of this is a business. And, and a business requires startup. And if you start a business with insufficient capital, even if it's successful, you won't be able to meet demand. You'll have cash flow problems. And there's a risk of, of, of it not working, even if you had a great idea. And my view is that, you know, part of becoming a trader is raising that capital. We've got to learn risk. We've got to learn technical analysis. We've got to learn products. And we've got to raise the capital because if you're undercapitalized, you're, you're, you're starting way on the back foot. That's so true. And, you know, I'm, I'm um, right now busy mentoring a young guy and uh, he, he's started trading about two years ago but he's not he, he hasn't been properly capitalized he he had about 30,000 rand and you know lost some of it and it ended up down at about 17,000 rand yeah. and all along I said to him you know you, you actually need to get more money in your account if you want to have a chance because otherwise you're just going to, going to constantly find this an impossible task and fortunately he's actually managed to raise some capital from a family member he's he's uh, got 150,000 rand now that he's able to trade with and that's been the case now if he got that capital about 2 months ago and it's it's incredible all of a sudden he's trading better and he's able to to yeah. just see it differently and he's actually trading profitably so it's it really really is a very important point that you need to be adequately capitalized if you don't have the right amount of money in your account you you've really got a very 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 slim chance of being success yeah then successful. you become discouraged and, and you, you you you're lost to trading forever um not for because of your ability but because of insufficient capital yeah absolutely so just know that it is it is an important point 
that's that's number one in in this exercise is and you've got to know how much that capital is and from here we're then going to move into the next point which is how much to risk but the the, the first question you have to always ask yourself is how much capital do you have in your trading business and how much are you willing to allocate to it so the second point then as I said is how much of your trading capital are you willing to risk on an individual trade and what I mean by that is in in essence trading is a probabilities game you can look at a stock and you can do all the analysis and what have you and say to yourself okay I believe this stock is is going up or I believe it's going down and at the end of the day what you're doing as a trader is you you're effectively placing a bet and taking a bet on whether your view is right or wrong so let's say for example you've spotted a stock you think the share price is going to go up I'd come to you and say okay how certain are you that you think that share price is going up how much of your money are you willing to lose to find out whether your view is correct or not and you get different thoughts from people I always ask people this on on my high probability trading courses some guys say oh I'll, I'll put 10% of my money on it or 20% of my money on it and often people people have too much of a high risk assumption so convention says you shouldn't risk more than two percent of your capital on a trade now that a lot of people are probably looking at that and saying gosh that sounds very very low I mean such a small amount how can you ever really hope to move the needle with such a small risk I'll explain it throughout the course of this presentation this evening but what it means is in the example here if you've got a 200,000 Rand trading account it essentially means that you you're going to risk 2% of that which is 4,000 Rand on an individual trade what that means is that if the trade is wrong you can lose 4,000 Rand it's not the exposure that you're taking it's the risk that you that you're taking and I'll show it to you in a in an a, an example shortly as to how how we work that out but that's something that I find people often get um, confused with they say how how can I make money when I'm only going to invest 4000 rand into a stock it's not investing 4000 as the exposure that's the risk that's how much money you actually would lose if the trade goes wrong and the nice thing about losing 2% of your money if you do get it wrong is that you've still got 98% left after that and that's the critical thing you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you have these massive drawdowns because you've taken too big of a risk and just on that point I mean I'll say and I think you might be the same Simon as I've gotten older and maybe wiser or, or you know my testicular fortitudes become less but I've actually found that mm -hmm. that numbers come down throughout my career and nowadays I often risk less than one percent of my capital yeah. on a trade. I mean I can confirm that to me a, a two percent at risk trade now I can almost feel my toes curling at, at, at the at the thought of it um, I, I'm doing I'm doing about probably 0.9 there's about of a percent risk in a particular trade yeah exactly and I'm the same and I'm the same. And, uh, when I was younger I used to have a yeah. bigger risk, risk appetite, <laughs> but then I was also a bit more naive as well <laughs> well uh, that's it we were younger and I think we were naive and, and and we had a different risk profile let's be honest as well yeah. you know we yeah. get older we have families certainly retirement isn't sort of one of those things far in the future suddenly it's just around the corner and I'm talking me here more than you you're the young guy in the room uh, but I'd certainly my risk profile has come down and it's made my trading a lot easier which obviously makes perfect sense but but even with two decades of trading experience the lower risk has just made it easier for me yeah that's right no absolutely we're on the same page there um, why do we go for such small risk assumptions that the reason is because of these things called clusters um, clusters can work in your favor or they can work against you now a, a cluster is where you get a whole lot of successive winning trades back to back or alternatively a whole lot of successive losing trades back to back it's the successive losses that you really need to be scared of those are the nasty ones and it's where it's it's there that you can really come short as a trader so the the illustration that I've got here works on an assumption that you've got some sort of a trading system where you're going to get 50% of your trades right and 50% of them wrong now theoretically by default you should just have a 50 50 win loss rate anyway because the share price is either going up or down so you by default you should have 50 50 I would hope that with the correct analysis and doing some careful 
planning and trading in the direction of the momentum etc you can actually improve that 50 percent and get it up closer to 60 or 70 percent but let's be conservative for the purposes of this example and we're going to work on um, on a 50 percent hit rate over here what that means is that if you think about it every trade that you do has got a 50 percent chance of being a winner or a loser so that means if you've done one trade will obviously you had a 50% chance. If you've done two trades, it's a half times a half, right? It means that you've got the chance of having two successive losses within every four trades that you do. And if we stretch that out, you do um, eight tr um, trades, it's a half times a half times a half. Well, sorry, a half times a half times a half is, is one over eight. It means that you've got the propensity or the potential of having three successive losses in every eight trades. Okay, and you can see how it stretches out here. I mean, by the time you get to um, you know, looking at 32 trades, you've got the, propen the possibility of having five successive losses in a row within, five, within every 32 trades. Now, and I can tell you in my own trading career, my own uh, record in terms of successive losses was 11 in a row. I once went through a period, it was in 2011, the market was very choppy and not much trend. It was a horrible market to try and trade. And I had 11 losses in a row and it was debilitating. I mean, I almost wanted to just give up and find a different career. But the point was that because I was trading with small risk, I was able to come back from that fairly quickly. The key being that if we just take this example where you're going to have five successive losses in a row, um, if you were risking, let's just say, 10% of your capital on individual trades and you have five successive losses in a row, well, then suddenly you've lost 50% of your capital. That then means that you need to make 100% return to get back to where you started. That's, that's too big of a drawdown to deal with, quite honestly. So why we risk such small capital? is because you want to make sure that when these clusters come along, they're not going to hurt you. They're not going to wipe you out. Do note uh, here, as I've mentioned at the bottom, is that these clusters do also apply to winning streaks as well. So you're going to have situations where you'll have five winners in a row or six winners in a row. And those are awesome. And you can really do well in that time. But it's the, the losing clusters that you really need to be very, very careful of. And it's those losing clusters, that, and that's the reason why we, we risk such a small percentage of capital um, on each trade is because these clusters do come along. Your your trading results are never just linear. You never have winner, loser, winner, loser, winner, loser, winner, loser. It's often, you know, winner, winner, loser, 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 winner, 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 loser, 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 loser. And if you have too many of those successive losses in a row and you're risking too much of your capital at once, it can very quickly create a massive drawdown in your account and that has a negative effect on two in two respects one is that obviously it wipes out a large chunk of your financial capital but also it it damages your emotional capital i.e. your confidence and you don't want to get to that point you want to remain confident in this business of, of trading so that's very very critical and it's one of the reasons why small risk is is such a huge thing that you've got to ensure on individual trades I think I've got to say, I, I love this slide. I, I've never seen this data before. I think I, I, my my string of losses was around about the same time. I think it was 2013, 2014, and it might have been 12, or maybe it was 11. And I tell you, it was hard. It it, it, it hurt my head. It hurt my balance, um, my, my, my account balance. But but this, to me, this is, this is a great slide. It, it, it gives you that expectancy that you're going to have this. This is going to happen. Yeah, it is. Statistically, you can't fault this. Yeah, um, it's it's going to happen. You know, with the best will in the world, it's going to happen to all of us at some point. And the key is that you've got to just make sure that your risk assumption is small enough that when you do have one of these horrible strings of losses, it's not going to hurt you too badly. Yeah. Right. So then the next question is, how do we size a position in order to achieve this optimal risk management? Um, and this is the simple formula that you use. It's a uh, it's quite simple. Number of shares or number of CFDs that you want to trade is calculated by taking the capital risk, dividing that by your risk per share. Now the risk per share is essentially the difference between your entry price and your stop loss. Okay, so if you're wondering about this, let me put it into an example for you. 
I've got a, a nice example here. It's actually a trade that I am in right now as we speak, and it's working out quite nicely. So I'm going to take you just back to Friday, where I originally did the analysis for this trade, and then I'm going to show you what's happened subsequently and how we're sitting with this trade at the moment. So this is um, analysis that I published on my website, on traderscorner.co.za. Every Friday we put out uh, a list of stocks that we feel have... Um, good potential from a technical analysis perspective. Things that are pulling back into support or stocks that are potentially about to break out or whatever. Essentially what we do is we publish anywhere between five and ten setups that we think have got technical relevance and that are worthy of monitoring for a trade in the week ahead. So this is literally word for word what we published on Friday last week and this is the chart that we published. So it is, says here basically um, the recent break above 50 Rand resistance was a bullish development that saw the price push up to 58 Rand 35. The price is now consolidating and pulling back after that recent break higher. The area around 50 Rand should now present support into a pullback and allow for an entry on the long side once again. Look to buy a pullback towards the 50 Rand area. Ideally, we'd want to see an hourly reversal in that area. Stop loss then is a break below an hourly reversal. We then look for another gap, uh, sorry, another push back up to the recent high at 58 Rand and quite possibly higher. And then I've made the point that there's a gap in the chart there at 62 Rand 40 from March. And that could also be a possible higher target that we might see in the weeks ahead. All right. So what happened since then? Well, this is now an hourly chart of, of MTN as it was, um, I think, yesterday when I published these, when I put these slides together. And what you can see happened subsequently is it pulled back. It got exactly to that 50 Rand level and it held it with absolute precision. You can see it formed a nice little doji candle on the hourly chart over there. Um, I bought it. I had an order in at 50 Rand and it, it managed to trade. So I was very pleased about that. I almost bought the low of the day. And then the next day the price popped up. And today, it, this doesn't show today's trading action, but it's been trading up here at about 55 Rand. So it's moved up 10% off my entry level already. And that's just since Monday this week. So four days later, um, three days later, it's looking pretty good. So here we go. It gave the opportunity to buy at that suggested 50 Rand area on the 25th of May and it gapped higher on Tuesday the 26th of May. So here was the strategy. Buy it at 50 Rand, stop loss below 48.50. Okay, 48.50 is down here somewhere where my cursor is. It's quite a nice far away area from where the entry was. And I'm looking at a target of 58, which is essentially a move back to that prior high that we saw last week. My risk per share is 1 Rand 50, right? The risk per share is the difference between my entry price at 50 Rand and my stop loss at 48 Rand 50. So the risk per share is 1 Rand 50. My upside to the target is 8 Rand. So what that means is my risk to reward ratio on this trade is 1 Rand 50 to 8 Rand, which if you simplify it down, it's essentially 1 to 5.3. Okay, so that's the setup as it was. Now, how did we calculate the position size here? So this is the, the putting all of those numbers into the formula that I mentioned. Here you go. Um, buy it at 50 Rand, stop loss at 48 Rand 50. Risk per share is 1 Rand 50. Um, we've got 200,000 Rand of available trading capital, as I said in the example. So 2% of that capital means we're willing to risk 4,000 Rand, i.e. we're willing to lose 4,000 Rand if this trade goes wrong. The number of CFDs that I would look to buy then is calculated by dividing that capital risk by the risk per share. So 4,000 Rand capital risk divided by 1 Rand 50, which is my risk per share, means I can trade 2,666 CFDs. All right. As I said, the target price is 58 Rand. So my potential profit here is 8 Rand times that number of CFDs, 2,666. It means I can make 21,000 Rand here as a potential profit on this trade. And I'm glad to say it's more than halfway already towards that profit now. Um, if I'm wrong, and it goes down and it triggers the stop loss at 48.50, well then it means that I lose 4,000 Rand. That's 2% of my trading capital. It's not the end of the world. I'm not going to lose sleep over that. I'm not going to cry about it, right? I've still got 98% of my capital left after that. And I'm still very much alive and well and confident to still go out and take the next trade. Now just a quick point at the bottom here, and this is 
what I, I stress here, people get confused with this risk figure of 4,000 Rand and whether that's the exposure that we're taking or what is it. it. Just to reinforce the point, it's the risk. It's the amount of money that you're willing to lose if the trade doesn't work. The exposure is this figure here. So the exposure is 2,666 CFDs multiplied by 50 Rand per share, which was my entry price. It means I've got an exposure to the market of 133,000 Rand. Okay, or exposure to MTN shares of 133,000 Rand. Now, a lot of people also then say, oh, but what about margin and gearing and all that? To be honest, I'm not bothered about gearing and, and margin. That's not really a concern of mine. What I'm really concerned about is how much money I'm going to lose when I'm wrong. Um, the margin and the gearing is, to me, it's just interesting, but it's not of any major significance, quite honestly. But just for, for those that are curious, I mean, I, I've traded this through IG markets. And 5% margin on this, which is what the MTN margin is currently, it's 5%. Um, so I'm having to put up 6,665 Rand as margin on a trade that's got 133,000 Rand exposure. Okay. I, I, I love that, Garth. I mean, so, so I trade index futures, Aussie. And in fact, someone asked me last week, what's the gearing and and i honestly don't know um and i was they were confused but the point is that the gearing almost doesn't matter because you know what your risk is um your risk is that four thousand and and therefore gearing is is, is of, of of no of, of no interest it's just it's yeah. it's a deposit you pay yeah that's right exactly and there's a lot of people get fixated on this idea about gearing but honestly what I will say about gearing is that the more geared you are, the more leveraged you are, the bigger your risk is, um, and the and and the harder the smack is going to be when it eventually yeah. comes. Yeah. So be careful of that and know that your focus has to be on the risk of loss or the, how much you're going to lose when you're wrong. Focus on that. Don't worry about how much the margin requirement is or how much gearing you've got. Don't worry. Just know how much you're going to lose when you get it wrong and be comfortable and, and, with that figure. And, and when you are wrong and that hits the 4,000 exit. Question coming through from Des. He says, do you move the stop loss higher at this point? You're, you're in some profit. Your initial stop was, what, 48.50. Do you move it up a bit or do you leave it where it initially was? Yeah, so I'll move it up because there's nothing more irritating than seeing a winning trade turning to a loser. Mm -hmm. So I will move it up. Um, certainly once it's moving in the right direction, then I move it up to my entry point. So then essentially I'm carrying no risk on the trade at that stage. The worst that can happen is I get out at break even. And then what I typically do once it's moving in the right direction now is I'll often look at something like the, fifth, the, the hourly 15 period exponential moving average as a trailing stop. So um, as long as it's still trading above that hourly 15 exponential moving average, I'm quite happy to stay in the trade. Um, as I said, my target here is 58. So if it gets to 58, I'll most likely bank some of that profit because I think it's just prudent to take some money off the table and pay yourself for a good trade. Yeah. But I did also mention that there's a possible higher target still in play as well, up at 62. So I would want to leave a little bit of a runner on to see whether I can't extract more out of that trade. And I'll leave that runner on, and as long as the price is still above the hourly 15 exponential moving average, I'll stay with the trade. And um, and I'll use that then as a trailing stop loss. Gotcha. And so by you, doing you, that, it'll yeah, you take some initial that, profit and then give opportunity to go further if it does. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, they yeah. say as a trader, you should, you should cut your losses quickly and you should run your profits. And that's essentially what I'm doing here. It, by, by having some sort of a trailing stop loss methodology, it allows me to run the profit if the trade is working. But if it's not working, I know where my stop loss is. And I also know where my trailing stop loss is going to take me out as well to protect my profits. And your, your, another question coming through about risk reward. You had a, quite a chunky risk reward in this particular example. At what risk reward would you walk away? I mean, if, if the risk reward was two to one, is, is that still sufficient? Or is that starting to sort of err on the, this is a little bit tight? Yeah, so two to one is about the worst that I would be willing to play with. Um, mm -hmm. If you can make double the amount of what you risk on a trade, then that's fine. Then let's let's go with the trade. But ideally, I like to see trades that give me a three to one risk reward potential or better. Those are those are the the the, the, the ones I'd ideally go for. But if it's less than two to one risk reward ratio, then it's sort of not really worth it in my view. Yeah. 
Yeah. Question from uh, Steve. He's asking, how much do you leave? In other words, at that 58, how much of the trade do you close? How much of the trade do you leave as a runner? I'll close half at that okay. point, uh, and then I'll leave the rest as a runner. Um, an anonymous uh, person is asking about slippage. Uh, would you make use of guaranteed stops, um, particularly at that initial, the 48.50 as you entered? No, I, I don't use guaranteed stops. Um, that's a personal preference. I'm not going to mm -hmm. say you know you should or shouldn't use them. It's just a personal preference. Um, the reason being, look, obviously they cost more to put a guaranteed stop in, and 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 in my experience, this that those kind of gaps and what have you, they happen from time to time, and they're frustrating when they happen. But they yeah. they're, they're not. That's far more the exception than the rule. And the the point is here. I mean, I've got. 2% capital risk on the trade. If it really something horrible came out and it gapped down, let's say it opened at 46 the next day, you know, so it down nearly 10% on the session. You know, I'll lose more than my 2%, but it's I might lose 4% or 5%, right? It's not uh, it's not crippling. So, in my experience, those guaranteed stop losses are kind of like insurance. You know, it's nice to have when you need it, but for the most most of the time, you just pay the premium and you never need it. And if you work it out over the long run, yeah, I don't know whether there's yeah, yeah, just self-insure. I just I, I don't know that the benefit is really going to be worth the cost in the long run. That's yeah. a personal preference, you know. Yeah. Obviously, I'm, it's open to debate because some people yeah. might see it differently. I mean, I, I I'm trading. I don't use them. Yeah, I mean, I trade Aussie intraday these days. My trading's done by nine o'clock in the morning. But I know a lot of people don't want to hold overnight because they're scared of a gap against them. And it happens. And when I was trading overnight, it happened to me, I mean, like, I think maybe a significant gap twice in my life. But equally so, sometimes I had the gap in my favor. You know, we, we you know, make no mistake, the gap against you is not fun. But sometimes the gap goes in your favor. And I like the idea of, you know, it's a risk assessment. Do you self-insure? Do you take insurance? Different for different people. Um, as long as you understand what that risk is and as long as you're comfortable with it, um, you're, you're absolutely sorted. Uh, Mark is asking, uh, would you advocate we always be trading CFDs rather than straight equities? Yeah. So if you're trading... And I always like to differentiate between trading and investing. So yeah, um, yeah. In, investing, let's just quickly unpack that. Investing is 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 something that's somewhat passive. You you invest with the long-term view. You buy shares because you like the, the company, the industry, the management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you look to then own underlying shares, the physical mm -hmm. shares. You look to collect collect the dividends every year and reinvest those dividends back into the market and so on. It's a relatively passive endeavor. For that, you'll use physical shares, equities. When it comes to active trading, I would go with CFDs. And it's for a, a couple of reasons. The first thing is the transaction costs are much lower on CFDs your, yeah. in terms of your brokerage, much, much lower. You know, when, you, when you're trading physical shares, there's all sorts of fees. There's obviously the brokerage, which is, is higher normally. Um, and then you've also got VAT and you've got market securities tax and insider trading levies and, yeah. um, and, and all sorts of other line items that they like to slap on top of, you know, but, so before you know it, your, your, your in cost on an, on an equity trade, it can be sort of 0.7 or 0.8% of the value of the transaction that you're doing. Whereas with CFDs, it comes out much, much lower than that. So I think if you're actively trading, rather use CFDs. Um, just know that also with CFDs, there is an interest component. So if you hold them for a very long time, the interest uh, for the funding cost does add up. But if you're trading, like my style of trading is to hold for a couple of days to maybe a couple of weeks maximum. Mm -hmm. In that case, the interest, the funding cost is, is negligible. So it's not something I worry about too much. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, I mean, I would advocate if you're actively trading, rather use CFDs than physical shares. Yeah, and if you're trading physical equity as well, your, your capital requirement is that much higher. I mean, you've essentially taken a 133,000 Rand position. Um, if your portfolio was only 200,000, then, then you haven't got much wiggle room to put a second trade on. Well, that's it. Exactly. That was going to be my next point is that trading CFDs does at least allow you the ability to take a bit of leverage on your capital. Yeah. Um, and, and physical equities don't allow you that, that ability.
Yeah, uh, I just want to form a, 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 a quick process. I'm seeing questions coming in. Those that are specific to where Garth is in the presentation, I'm asking them now. A couple I'm parking for the end because they're sort of more timeless. So I'm seeing them. I'm not ignoring you, Joey, uh, Des, etc. Uh, we will get to those as well. Yeah. Okay. Just quickly, while we're here, Simon, I just want to. I'm going to take a opportunity to have a. Um, a shameless plug of my service but I, there, I, there's a reason for this um, and you'll see now in terms of this position sizing um, calculation that we're talking about here now we actually have a thing on traderscorner.co.za if you go here this is a, a useful tool that people uh, got to you're use. not seeing you because you're showing PowerPoint you need to change ah. your screen to uh, okay. Uh, browser okay all right sorry let me just I didn't realize that uh, new share, and we're going to look at that one. There we go. Can you see my my website now? No, still not. Uh, you got to manage it in the there actual app. Yeah, there we go. Now, now we can, now see. You can yes. see it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, let me just quickly log in. It's going to take me one second. Um, the the reason I'm just going here quickly and doing a shameless plug is because I've got we've got a position sizing calculator here that is quite useful so if you go to if you're a subscriber there's this thing called traders tools and you click on that there's a position sizing calculator over here and it actually opens in a separate little window but if you if you look at this this actually does the position sizing calculation for you so let's just do that example that we had of MTN quickly and assume that portfolio account is 200,000 Rand the capital at risk is 2% we're going long and my entry price I said was 50 Rand and my stop loss was 48 Rand 50 then you calculate there it is so it tells you your portfolio risk is 4,000 Rand your risk per share is 1 Rand 50 and the number of shares to trade or the number of CFDs is 2,666 so that is a useful little tool if you were wanting to know how to size a position this thing is available and um, it just basically does the exact exercise of what what I've just been showing you, essentially. All right, I'll get back to my presentation there, but I just thought that that was um, a useful thing to share with everyone, Simon. All right, are we good? Can you see my yeah. PowerPoints? Yep, we're back to your PowerPoint. Okay, super. Yeah, okay. Um, right, then this is the, the next point is then a lot of people say to me, okay, that's fine. You can risk 2% of your capital on one trade. No problem. But what if you have 20 trades open and they're all risking 2%? So what is the right number of trades to have open at any one time? So my personal rule is no more than four trades at once. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, obviously, it, the overall capital risk is contained then. Um, but the second point is also it comes down to focus. I like to be able to focus on what I'm watching. I don't want to be having my eyes spread across too many different stocks at one time. So for that reason, I limit it to four. You can change that if you wish. You know, if you wanted to take the risk assumption down, maybe instead of 2%, you take it down to 1%, and then you want to trade six or eight individual trades at a time. It's fine. You can. I, I just, for me, it's a personal preference. I don't like to have more than four trades on at once. And doing that um, also gives me the, the knowledge that my overall capital risk is um, is contained. Yeah, when I traded equities, I never went beyond, I think it was four or five. It just to me, it was too much stress. Yeah, well, that's it, exactly. And you want to try and make this as simple as possible and not, uh, not overstress yourself. Yeah. And you want to sleep at night at the end yeah. of the day, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so always ask yourself, uh, it, it, you know, almost as a, point of routine each morning if all my stop losses got to be triggered right now how much money would I lose and and are you comfortable with that that's the critical thing um, and if if not you need to probably then scale back and not not have such a big exposure all right so the next point then is to move on and show you an exercise in risk management and this is the 30 trade exercise that I referred to. And it's something I challenge everyone to do that comes on my high probability trading courses. So the, the exercise works as follows. First thing all, you, you, you're going to dedicate yourself to 30 trades with the utmost discipline. Discipline in terms of following a correct process, discipline in terms of following stop losses, and discipline in terms of not risking more than 2% of your capital on one individual trade. 
Um, the assumption is that your win rate is 50%, so you're going to get you know half your trades right and half of them are going to be wrong. You're risking 2% of your capital on each trade, right? The risk to reward ratio we're aiming for on the trades here is 1 to 2.5, so that's not too onerous. You should be able to do better than that, but that's what we're aiming for in terms of the assumption here. All right, so your winners are 2.5 times bigger than your losers. And it's a simplistic view here. So we're not looking at clusters. We're sort of assuming that your wins and losses are somewhat evenly distributed. Um, there's no compounding included in this calculation. And your transaction costs have been ignored in this case, right? Just for the purposes of simplicity. Now, what it means is that after two trades, you've essentially should have had one winner and one loser. The winner cost you 2% of your capital, the loser cost you 5% of your capital. So net net you're up 3%. After four trades you've had two losers and two winners. Your two losers have cost you 4% of capital. Your two winners have earned you 10% of capital. So net net you're up 6%. Okay and so it goes and so it goes and so it goes until at the end of the exercise you've had 30 trades 15 of them were losers, so they cost you 30% of your capital, but 15 of them were winners, and they made you 75% return on capital. So net-net, you're up 45% on your capital. Right, now the question I ask is, is this a satisfactory return? Would you be happy with this? I hope so. And, um, and the next thing is, are you dedicated enough to do it? And you know, Simon, on my high probability course, I have... I, I, present this scenario to everybody that attends the course and say go and try and come back to me after you've done your 30 trades and if you've managed to achieve this type of return and you can prove it I'll buy you lunch and you know that after what have I been doing my course for eight years not one person has ever come back to me and managed to do it and I had a guy I had a guy he was down in Durban and he looked so promising he was very disciplined and everything and he was emailing me every week and saying you know this is how I'm doing and he was looking good he got halfway there and then suddenly the emails stopped coming and I didn't hear from him for about three weeks and I emailed him back and I said what's happening I haven't heard from you and he said you know I just had a I had a wobble and on one trade I lost everything lost all my all my winners and it was just that one trade where he was ill-disciplined on the stop loss and I think he added to the loser on the way down or something like that and it wiped out all his winners so I, I think it comes down to discipline but the point is to everyone listening to this try try this try and commit to doing 30 trades with absolute discipline and absolute focus on your risk and ensure that you can get a decent risk to reward ratio on all of your trades and see whether you can achieve this type of return and I'd love to hear from anyone that manages to do it. It definitely is possible. I've, I've no doubt in my mind that it's possible. I just think that people lack the discipline to be able to stick to the exercise. And I know Simon, in your trading, I mean, you've you've become very disciplined over the years, and you you would, I'm sure, be able to to do this. But um, yeah, it's... and it is, you know, to, I, I've I, the story of the of the gent from Durban. I, I've particularly when I worked at Standard Bank, I'd hear that story far too often where you know, you do everything and it just takes, you know, one, one ill-disciplined trade. And it's almost like driving, you know, you're driving down the freeway at 120. And if you, you know, one mistake and suddenly you're careering off and, 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 and into, you know, wild accidents and stuff. And it's that constant focus. And, you know, Garth, as you're saying, I mean, I remember when we, you did that podcast series uh, for IG and, and, and uh, when I was chatting with you, I mean, my skill set, and I worked this out, quite early in my trading career, my skill set was not technical analysis. Um, I, I loved it, but I would overcomplicate it. That was not my skill set. Um, so then I said, well, what can I make my edge in a sense? And to me, it, it was focusing on that discipline, particularly on, on, on stop loss. And you know, my claim to fame is that I have executed every stop loss perfectly for nigh on 20 years and 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 that's what's made me the profit just avoid the 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 the, the, the crashes and 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 you'll 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 live to fight another day it's so true and and i mean you referenced my tv show earlier the traders corner tv show yeah. that i did on on business day for 10 years until i left for the uk and um and the I can honestly say the only reason that show was successful for 10 years was because every single stop loss was adhered to for 10 yeah. years and that's it. it you know i had plenty of losing trades along the way but none of them were very big 
and um, and that saved me, and it's it's that is critical. Yeah, absolutely critical. Yeah. Uh, Craig is pointing out that your column headers are inversed. Your winners and losers are on the wrong sides. Oh, goodness! <laughs> well done. <laughs> you see, I put this together at about ten o'clock at night the other night, and I think I might have had two whiskeys while I was doing it. Yeah, you're so, just showing off now. You guys in the UK have whiskey. We get our whiskey back on Monday. <laughs> yeah, good. Good luck and enjoy it. You all deserve it. I must say. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. All right, this is the last slide, um, and it's the power of compounding. I said to you it would surprise you how how compounding can add up. But this is, and I apologize for the small text here. I hope you can read it, but yeah. uh, it had to be small just to put it all in. So essentially what I'm saying to you is take three years, right, 36 months. Do you think that you can generate a 3% per month return on your capital through trading? following the type of principles we've discussed here, adhering to stop losses, etc. I, 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 well, I know it is definitely possible, right? So 3% per month is, is definitely possible. More than that is also possible, but let's be conservative. We assume that your returns are compounded monthly, and obviously, okay, this excludes any taxes and things for simplicity. The point is that a 3% monthly compounded return over three years will generate you close on 200% return in three years. So your 200,000 Rand that you start with, if you can consistently compound that at a rate of 3% per month on average, you can come out with close to 600,000 Rand after a three year period. You can almost triple your money in that time. Do you think it's possible? And that's the question I'm gonna leave you with. Do you think it's possible? I certainly do, do believe it's possible. Um, and I just think that it comes back to what we were talking about. It's all about discipline. If you can be disciplined, achieving a 3% monthly return on average is not that hard, actually. And you'll find that there are going to be some months where you might not make the 3% for whatever reason. But there will also be those other months where you make 6 or 7 or 8% in a month. Yeah. Right? So if you can average them out and generate 3% per month on average, yeah, your money can triple in three years. Yeah, and I think I've seen you do this chart for a 10-year period and the numbers get absolutely staggering. I love that last question. Do you think this is possible? And I'm going to encourage people on the webcast to go and have a look at, listen to the interview that Garth did with Dr. David Paul. Um, and he, he talks a lot about mindset. Um, and it, it's something which, which, which played a huge part in my early days of trading and, and kind of, I don't talk about it as much before. But having that mindset, having that belief is, is, is hugely important. Um, if, you, if you follow Garth on Twitter, uh, Traders Corner is, is the handle. Um, you'll find the links to it and go listen to that one. They're all great, but particularly the one with David Paul where he talks about we need to believe. That's critically important. Mm, that's so true. That was a great interview. He's one of the guys that really gets the psychology of trading. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. I, mean, I think we've got, what, 10 minutes left. We've got Simon. some time. We've got some questions coming in. Joey, you are asking uh, that I mentioned my trading is done by 9 a.m. Can I elaborate? I can. So I trade index futures, uh, Aussie in this case. Uh, I'm trading so via Safix, the JSE. Um, and, and my problem was, I mean, I, I've day traded. I've spent the, the 10 hours a day in front of the screen. I've done daily, weekly. I've, I, I've been... What I needed was something that, that enabled me to, to get some trading um, and then get away from the market. And, and one of my skills, which is not technical analysis, but one of my skills is, is just reading the action in the short term. In other words, you know, what's happening in the next 5 or 10 or 15 minutes? So I trade Aussie futures. I trade it pre-equity open, so the 8.30 to 9 o'clock window. Um, and I've got nothing on my chart. I'm looking at bid and offer. And I'm looking at, at the trades as they go through so I can see who's crossing the spread. Um, I'm typically in a trade by 8.40, 8.42, pretty much my latest. I put a stop in. I put a take profit. Um, and what it does is it frees the rest of my day to pre-COVID. My plan was to go and train for an Ironman. Now under lockdown, it frees the rest of my day to, to do webcasts and presentations and the like. Um, but it's, it's, it's designing... I always say to people, don't change yourself to the market. Adapt the market to what your requirements are because the market is limitless. And, and you know, we've got different exchanges, products, assets we can trade, etc. Um, find those that work for you. 
if you want more, you can drop me a mail. I've got a video of it, uh, Simon at justonelap.com. Uh, Johan, absolute pleasure. Uh, and Paul's asking, do you think there's opportunity for the 3% per month given COVID-19? Garth, I imagine, I mean, March was probably a wild time for, for equity traders and holding uh, uh, over a couple of days and the like. Um, but if anything, the volatility perhaps, it increases risk, but the flip side of that is it increases opportunity. Yeah, it most definitely does increase uh, um opportunity as well as you say and heading into covid i must say we when I mean, something we do on traders corners obviously we, we constantly on the lookout for for our trading ideas and funnily enough we actually spotted a number of setups on the short side ahead of that and and it's not you know because we had any sort of um, foresight that covid was coming it's just that actually there were quite a lot of sort of rather ominous looking technical setups on the charts so we did quite well on the on the short side when the market collapsed. So to answer the question, you know, are there opportunities when when COVID is around? Absolutely, there are. And if, if in fact, if anything, the last two or three months for me have been quite a lot of fun to trade, just because there's been so much volatility around, and there have therefore been a lot of opportunities. So yeah, I mean, definitely, it's been possible, notwithstanding COVID. Yeah. Uh, a question coming through from anonymous tax uh, impact. Uh, I'm going to touch briefly on tax. So we're not the experts and not in any sense wanting to give tax advice. The SARS ruling says that if you're buying with the intention of selling within three years, uh, you're essentially a trader and therefore profits are taxed as income. Um, but I stress the profits. And if we go back to Garth's example right at the beginning of this is a business, profits are income less costs. Costs would be brokerage, losing trades, subscriptions, etc. If you're buying with the intention to hold for longer than three years, then you'll be taxed as uh, CGT um, as per SARS. But my advice is always is, is speak to the experts in that space. Uh, Garth, a question coming through. Any good resources for some technical trading strategies? I mean, obviously, your, your website is a, is a sort of a real world type of resource. Are there are there others which you often send people towards? Um, yeah, there's a couple of others, you know, out there. I, I follow a lot of guys globally who look at technicals on various different things, be they offshore stocks or offshore indices. Um, you know, I think so. There, there are other resources out there available. In terms of what we do, I mean, myself and and my colleague Andrew Todd, the Run Traders Corner, we we're basically doing that work anyway. We and we focus primarily on um, on the JSE. So we're looking through our watch list of stocks mm -hmm. every week, every day, in fact, and trying to spot technical opportunities that stand out to us. So it is definitely one of the resources that are available um, to, our, to our subscribers. There are some others. There are some other guys in South Africa who also do um, technical analysis research. Like Colin Abrahams is one of them. He does a, a, a newsletter. That's right, yeah. Um, and there are one or two others as well. I'm um, Sean Morrison at IG. He puts out some technicals yeah. once a week. So there certainly are a couple of other sources out there that are available. Definitely. Uh, a couple of questions coming through, which I'm going to kind of merge together. Des, you were saying, do you recommend stop losses on sort of your long-term equities? Um, and then a question on the other side, is the risk management only for trading also use this when investing, for example, in ETFs? And I'm going to break it into two parts and I'll let Garth if he has any further input. When I'm buying my long-term ETFs and I'm buying a globally diverse ETF every month on the JSC, because it's diverse, because it's global, I just buy and forget. You know, if I was buying niche ETFs, like perhaps I was buying the, the Indy 25, then I would bring some, some risk management into it. When I'm doing my long-term investing, I am bringing in risk management as well in terms of position size, um, how much of the portfolio should it be? And I'm still having a stop loss, but my stop loss is less price based. I'm more, I'm more looking at the company and saying, you know, does this company, let's take ShopRite. You know, that stock is down more than 50% from its highs of a year or two ago. Um, but is it still a quality uh, uh, African food retailer? Are people going to continue eating? Um, would I have liked to have sold it at the highs and bought at the bottoms? Of course, but that's a different strategy and, and not what I'm doing in that space. So I'm managing risk, but I'm doing it differently in my equity portfolio 
than I would in a trading portfolio. Uh, Garth, any thoughts from you on that? Yeah, Simon, I must say, I, I, I've become a little bit jaded about this buy and hold strategy uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's just, we, we've all, when I mean, we've seen the stories, you know, the Steinhoffs and the yeah. EOH and the Tonga Aspen and, even. And that list just uh, yeah. goes on. Yeah, yeah Sassel. you know, <laughs> Sassel. I mean, there's stocks that are that are down, you know, and, and these are supposedly blue chip, you know, buy and forget type stocks mm -hmm. um, that are down, you know, 80% plus. So I've become quite a, kind of quite jaded about this whole buy and hold sort of strategy. And I, I think that you do need to have some sort of a technical overlay on your long term investments as well. And something that keeps you in when things are going well, but also something that gets you out when things are not going well. So so something that I look at is, for example, like just a simple, um, a simple thing. Look at a 50 week moving average and a 100 week moving average. And when the 50 week moving average is above the 100 moving average, you can be in that stock and that's fine. If it starts to head in the other direction where your 50 week moving average starts to cross down below the 100 week moving average, then maybe it's time to consider getting out. And you know that if you had employed that strategy with EOH, with um, Aspen, with Steinhoff, with yeah. Breit, and I mean, I can rattle off a whole bunch of others. It wouldn't have got you out at the top, but it certainly would have got you out before the real waterfall decline came around. And I think from that point of view, there's definitely something to be said for having a, a, some kind of a stop loss strategy on your long term investments. Because this um, notion that things just, you know, you buy blue chip and then you keep it forever. I think that strategy has been found very, very wanting over the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm saying before COVID even. You I know, mean, to me, the, 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 yeah. the driver there was GM, which had been the share everyone must own. And then in 08, it went bankrupt. I mean, it got bailed and everything else. But it was one of those classic uh, bottom draw type of shares that, that simply didn't work. Um, yeah. we've, got, we've got a bunch more questions. I want to quickly try to see if we can get them. Steve, you're saying better in your personal capacity or as a business. There's pros and cons to both, um, but understand there are no tax loopholes. SARS has shut those all down uh, left, right, and center. Uh, chat to an accountant. But, but there were times when one was stand out better than the other. Uh, that no longer, no longer applicable at all. Um, a bunch of questions around stop loss has been missed. We, we kind of touched it. Yes, there is risk. It might be missed, but you still take it. You you never, if, if you know, as Garth said, his stop loss was 48.50 in that example. Even if it's suddenly 46, you still take the stop loss. You you, you never exalt, ignore the stop loss. Um, questions around the slides. Yep, uh, we have recorded. It will be up on Just One Lap uh, in a couple of hours. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel. So the video will be available. Um, and I'm going to leave it there because we are hitting half past six. And I know no one has to fight traffic, but we've got to go and, and say hello to our families and have some dinner and everything else. Uh, ladies and gents, I appreciate your time this evening. Uh, Garth, I really appreciate your time. Always appreciate, appreciate the expertise. It's always a great privilege uh, listening to someone who, who really does this and, 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 and lives it and, and is, is, is proof that, that trading is, is, is a viable uh, a, a business strategy. And I like that analogy to business. Mm, fantastic Th Simon thanks very much for the opportunity as always I appreciate it and thanks to everybody for tuning in and listening everyone uh, have a, a good evening stay safe and uh, we'll chat again at our next power hour coming up 18 June we've got Satrix they're looking ETF they're looking local and they'll be looking offshore everyone stay safe cheers all <laughs>